my dear listeners, my dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode of the Women of the Bible. While we are listening to another story of a woman, and today I'm going to talk about Priscilla. Priscilla, her name, the diminutive of Prisca means worthy or venerable. This is your pastor Yadi. Welcome. As you know that you are. So, so her name, as I said, is the diminutive of Prisca means worthy or venerable. <coughs> Excuse me. Her character one of the first missionaries and a leader of the early church along with her husband Aquila she risked her life for the Apostle Paul Priscilla was a woman whose spiritual maturity and understanding of the faith helped build up the early church and her sorrow, her sorrow. Live from NPR News, I'm Corva Coleman. Cross border fire has increased in recent weeks along the Israel Lebanon border. Excuse me for that. It's all about technology, right? It's, sorry. So, her sorrow. To experience opposition to the gospel from both Jews and Gentiles and a joy to spread the gospel and nurture the church. The key verses in this story is from Acts 18 and chapter 19 and then Romans chapter 16 verses 3 to 4 and 1 Corinthians 16 19 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 19 so let's hear her story how good it is to have Paul back again she thought Ephesus was on fire with the gospel their young church growing stronger each day. Paul's preaching and miracles have brought many to faith. Even the touch of his hand chief had healed illnesses and delivered people from evil spirits. Priscilla couldn't help laughing when she heard the story of Sceva's seven sons. Jewish exorcist, exorcist, sorry, who had tried to duplicate such wonders by driving out an evil spirit with a magic invocation. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. But the spirit that merely mocked them, saying, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man they were trying to deliver beat them so soundly they ran bleeding and naked from the house. The Ephesians were so impressed by what had happened that a number of sorcerers held a public bonfire to destroy their scrolls. Their magical formulation and incantations seemed like useless drinked in light of the greater power of Jesus. But despite the progress of the gospel, Priscilla was aware of growing oppositions, and one day she heard the sounds of a crowd forming in the streets. A silversmith was shouting to other craftsmen all of whom made their living selling miniature images of the many-breasted goddess Artemis. 
Man, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess of self, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. The crowd erupted into a riot, seizing two of Paul's companions. Priscilla was distressed when Paul insisted on addressing the mob. She was certain such boldness could only end in worse violence. With her husband's help, she was able to restrain Paul until a city official calmed the crowd, the crowd and it dispersed. Soon after, Paul set out to spread the gospel in Macedonia, though the book of Acts describes the riot in Ephesus. It does not tell does not tell us that either Priscilla or Aquila were actually present, and only that some disciples prevented Paul from entering the fray and possibly saving his life in process. Since Priscilla and her husband were leaders of the church in Ephesus, it is quite possible they were among those who intervened on Paul's behalf. Priscilla's faith had been planted years earlier in an atmosphere of strife and controversy, first in Rome and later in Corinth. The latter was a commercial enter famous for its appetite for vice, hardly a place to nurture the faith of a new believer. Yet, that was where God transplanted her along with her husband, Aquila, after Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in AD 49. Tired of their constant fighting about Christus, a probably referring to Christ. Though various gods were worshipped in Corinth, none was more popular than Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, whose temple at one time boasted more than a thousand sacred prostitutes. And throughout the empire, the phrase Corinthian girl was just another name for prostitute. After the couple had been in Corinth for about a year, they met up with a man who would involve them in yet more controversy. Paul of Tarsus was a Jew who had ruthlessly persecuted Jesus' followers until his own dramatic conver conversion. Now, lately, he had been traveling in Asia Minor and Macedonia, preaching the gospel wherever he went. When he arrived in Corinth, he probably met the couple through their common trade as tent makers. Priscilla and Aquila invited Paul to stay in their home and work with them. As always, Paul preached the gospel first in the local synagogue and then to the Gentiles. And, as always, his preaching generated both faith and opposition. After 18 months, leading Jews of Corinth hauled him before the proconsul to accuse him of spreading an illicit religion. And after the charge was dismissed, Paul set sail for Ephesus, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. The three missionaries must have been eager to see a city 
that ranked in importance with Rome, Corinth, Antioch, and Alexandria, the capital of provincial Asia. Ephesus boasted a temple to Artemis and also known as Diana, so enormous that it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. After only a short while, Paul left for other ports, leaving the couple behind to lead the church that met in their home. Before long, another Jew arrived, preaching eloquently about Jesus to the Jews of Ephesus. But Apollos, a native of Alexandria, had grasped only a shadow of the gospel. One more in keeping with the message of John the Baptist than of Jesus. Rather than denouncing him for his inadequate pre pre uh, presentation, Priscilla and Aquila merely took him aside and instructed him in the faith. They did their job so well, in fact, that believers in Ephesus eventually sent the gifted preacher to Corinth, where he advanced the work Paul had begun. Priscilla must have been a spiritual mature woman whose gifts equipped her for leadership. Her name actually precedes Aquila's four out of the six times that they are mentioned in the New Testament, probably signifying her greater ability as a leader of the fact that her family may have hailed from a higher social strata than his. Whatever the case, Priscilla's role in instructing Apollos and leading the early church is remarkable. Along with Aquila, she was the best friend of Paul could have had, helping him establish the church and risking her life for her, his sake. Paul mentions the couple's courage in one of his letters, but doesn't elaborate on the circumstances. Rather than riding in the soil of controversy, Priscilla's faith seemed to flourish. She helped establish the early church in an atmosphere of great hostility, risking her own life for the sake of the gospel she loved. So as I mentioned that she probably with her husband were tent makers and so, so Paul came to work with them. And although tents themselves are often mentioned in the Bible, the skill of tent making is only mentioned once here in Acts 18. Paul stayed with Aquila and Priscilla and worked with them in their tent making trade. By New Testament times, the Israelites had settled in towns and cities. They no longer lived a nomadic lifestyle. Moving their tents from place to place, however, traders and travelers still used these tents, and some near eastern desert people still lived in them. Indeed, some desert people still live in tents today. Tents of the time were made of strong cloth woven of goat hair. Lengths of clothes were sewed together to form tents that were sometimes round and slopping, sometimes oblong. Poles held the tent up, along with ropes that were stretched to stakes, which were driven into the ground to hold the poles and the cloth firmly in place. Mats of papyrus or more goat hair formed side curtains and interior walls to divide the inhabitants from each other or from their animals. Paul was originally from Tarsus, a major city of Sicilia, I mean Cilicia, a province known for its production of superior cloth made of goat hair. Jewish parents took serious the responsibility of teaching their sons a trade 
and Paul's parents were no exceptions. Paul learned his trade and used it at times to support himself during his years of ministry. As a tent maker, Paul's skill may have been used in making things other than tents themselves. In the settled culture of his day, the market for tents was small. He may have instead produced leather products or clothing. We usually think of Paul in terms of his great missionary adventures. Seldom we think of him in terms of a trade that involved working, not with his quick and able mind, so much as with his hands. More than anything, Paul's work reveals to us the sacred nature of all work, whether esteemed or not by our cultures. All work is valuable and worthwhile in God's sight, and all work is worth doing with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. That is the Lord Christ you are serving. <clears throat> so read the scriptures in the book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 18, the verses 1 to 21 to 28. First, what does verse 2 tell you about what it was to, to be like a Jew, a Jewish woman in the Roman Empire? Make a list of everything this chapter says Priscilla did to advance the gospel. And what impression do you get of Priscilla as a person? And what role do you think God wants you to play in advancing the gospel? Scriptures doesn't tell us exactly what role Priscilla played in the circumstances described in the New Testament. Was she active as a teacher or did she work in the background? But the very fact that her name appears along with her husband's every time does tell us something. She was a valued disciple, one who made a difference in Paul's life and in her world whatever your role as a woman in your church, whether in the background or in the leadership position, you can be sure that what you are doing matters. Each task, no matter how small or large, is important to the spread of the gospel. And you are an integral part of your church community and God promises to use you. Let us pray, Father, we don't want to settle for the status quo, professing beliefs in you and then acting as though everything good in life comes from the world around us. Enable us to be like Priscilla, whose faith grew despite her surroundings. Let the ripples effect of our faith build up your church. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Remember, as I speak to all the women who are listening remember dear brothers and sisters and you women you are seen known and loved by the savior and he offers new life to all of you so you will hear me next time may god's grace overflow in your hearts this is your pastor, Yeti. Have a great day. Bye-bye.
And so let me remind you that this was the last podcast on this study of women of the Bible. So it's not the end of my podcast, of course. So I'm going to look for to create something new to move along and to keep you busy in your life so you will hear me next time bye bye